it's probably one of the best kept secrets in Nashville. I mean, it, it's got everything that makes a good story. It's got intrigue, it's got conspiracy, it's got cover up, it's got conflict, and it all revolves around four characters basically. You see, there was Senior, and there's Junior, and there's three, and then there's me. Well, it all kind of started accidentally. Uh, several years ago, I had to get a stent put in my heart, which really surprised me and a lot of people, and I think more surprised were the doctors. Uh, they kept asking me, do you have a history of heart disease in your family? And it's like, well, I, I don't know. I'm an adopted child. Uh, I don't know anything about my birth parents. And they were like, well, maybe it's time you find out. I mean, this is pretty important stuff. I mean, there's something that's caused this blockage in your heart. So I said, well, I'll see what I can find out. So I dug around, I found my adoption papers, and they, they really didn't tell me much. It was very vague. Uh, I didn't have a name of a birth father or birth mother. About the only thing I got out of it when I was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1951. Well, about the same time, I found out that the state of Alabama had changed their adoption laws. And what they were now allowing was, if you were a child adopted out of Alabama, you could request what they called the sealed files. So I wrote them, sent them a 20 bucks, and sure enough, a couple of months later, here it comes, my sealed files. And I opened it up, or actually there was nothing to open. They were already open and empty. There was nothing in my file. And it's like, why would you keep an empty file, much less send an empty file to somebody? And that's when things really started adding up. See, Montgomery was Hank's hometown. In fact, that's where he's buried. And uh, of course, I was born in 51 in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I was adopted in 1952. Of course, Hank died New Year's Day, 53, when I was a year and a half old. But one thing that was interesting is, 52, the year that I was adopted, is also ironically the year that Hank wrote and charted the song, My Son Calls Another Man Daddy. In my adoption papers, it stated that my birth mother was the only parent worthy of notification, and it got me thinking, well, my birth father's not worthy of notification, what's with that? And then I realized, about that same period there in the early 50s, Hank was considered unworthy. He was, he was undependable. I mean, nobody could count on Hank. He, he missed shows. If he showed up to a show, he's probably going to be drunk, may not be able to do the whole show. Uh, in fact, it got so bad, Louisiana Hayride dropped him, the Grand Ole Opry dropped him. Even his best friend, Roy Acuff, who was his you know producer, dropped Hank, said, I can't work with him. He said he's got a million-dollar voice and a 10-cent brain. And then it gets real interesting. And going through my adoption papers, I came across another set of adoption papers and it seems that I had been readopted in 1953. Now, same parents, Dave and Bert Flanagan, and why there had to be a readoption a year later, I don't know, but this time in the readoption, unlike in the first adoption where it said that my birth mother was the only parent worthy of notification, this time it says she's the only living parent. So my birth father had passed away in that one year period. Now my readoption was in February of 53. Of course, I ain't died New Year's Day of 53, just two months earlier. So and I, I never could figure out why they did the readoption, but things had obviously changed. There was a lot of us, I'm sure. I mean, Hank was really popular with the women. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one. In fact, I know I'm not the only one. Look at uh, Jet. I mean, Jet Williams, first discovered that she was probably Hank's illegitimate daughter when she was in her 20s. Jet's story is real interesting too. It seems that Jet was, I guess, in college when she receives this check for $2,000 that came from Hank's mother after she had died. And Jet gets to thinking, why am I getting a check from Hank Williams' mother? And so Jet starts doing a little discovery. And ironically, she started the same place I did in Alabama. She requested her sealed files, and guess what Jet got? open empty files. So Jed ends up hiring this investigative attorney, uh, I think his name was Keith Atkinson, and in a matter of days he uncovers this custodial agreement that Hank had signed. It seems that Hank's attorneys have said, buddy, if you're going to keep having all these damn illegitimate children, you're going to have to step up the plate and be responsible. You can't just keep popping out babies and running off, you know, paying women off, whatever. 
So they got Hank to sign this thing just a few months before Hank died. And of course, Jet was born three or five days after Hank's death, right there, January of uh, 53. So what Jet learned, or, or rather what Keith uncovered was, there was this huge conspiracy in Nashville to cover up all these illegitimate children that Hank had. And everybody was in on it. The attorneys, his friends, even Roy Acuff knew about it, but everybody was keeping it hush-hush. In fact, it was 1989. Um, there was a guy by the name of Smith. Mr. Smith was the executor of Hank's estate. Well, the Alabama Supreme Court found Smith and, the, and Hank's family attorneys both guilty of committing fraud in trying to cover up and hide the fact that Hank had these illegitimate children. Do I want to pursue it legally? No, uh-uh. I'm too old for that. I mean, I just retired. And the last thing I want to do is spend my retirement leave uh, years getting into a legal battle. I mean, hell, Jet spent nine years in litigation fighting that. It's just, it, it's not worth it. It's no telling how much money she spent. You know, she did end up marrying that guy, Keith Atkinson, who was the investigator, and that maybe saved her some money or made him a buttload of money, but no, I, 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 that's not what I'm into it for. I mean, hell, Jet argued her case in the probate court, the circuit court, uh, the state supreme court, the federal courts in New York, uh, and hell, five times in front of the damn supreme court. I mean, I don't have time for that. Yeah, there, there's other similarities other than the fact that I've always been driven to whiskey and women and writing songs just like Hank, but here's an interesting one. In 1952, Hank got drafted and right at the end of his physical exam, they failed him and they reclassified him for elf because he had a congenital back disorder. 20 years later in 1972, I got drafted to go to Vietnam. I failed my physical exam at the draft board too. Same thing, got reclassified 4F because I've got a congenital back disorder. There was one last thing I wanted to show you. I've got it in my guitar case, which is full of clippings of mainly deceased singer-songwriters and all. I've got everything from Hank Thompson, Earl Shrugs, just Doc Watson. Uh, I saw one. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Hank Williams' last trip driver driver dies. This is Charles Carr, the guy that was 18 years old, was driving the car that Hank died in. But what I was looking for is this, which is a the certificate of death for Hank Williams, which I love on the here where it says occupation radio singer. But what's important about this document is the cause of death. And the doctor says here that it was acute right ventricular dilation. So I guess that's the answer I've been looking for. The journey I've been on all this time was trying to determine if there was any heart disease in my family, and I think this proves there was. Well, it's just like the song says. We got the same damn eyes, wear the same hat size. Hell, we even like to have the same fun. And that's what made me Hank Williams. Illegitimate son.